Welcome to the FAA Production Studios and the FAA Safety Team's National Resource Center located in the Sun and Fun Complex in beautiful Lakeland, Florida. Our next presenter is the president of Lockwood Aviation Supply and he is the only Kodiak authorized master service center in North America. He is the foremost expert on Rotax engines, their care, their feeding, ADs, and surface information for the two and four stroke light sport aircraft engines. His topic today is the pilot's guide to Rotax engine maintenance. Let's welcome Phil Lockwood. Well, thanks for the great introduction. Okay, folks, uh, got some great weather here this week. It's been, uh, we've been fortunate with that. I'm going to give you some uh, insight into the technical aspects of the 9 Series engines and some uh, current maintenance information. I think you'll, uh, you should pick up some, uh, some good points. <clears throat> I want to begin with some of the unique characteristics of the 9 Series engines and why it's different from the typical Lycoming and Continental engines that most of us are more familiar with. First, the uh, 9 Series Rotax has water-cooled heads, and that is what enables it to get so much power out of such a small displacement. Only about uh, 1,400 cc's on a, uh, a 912S, and so we run it at higher RPM, and that enables us to get a lot of power out of a very compact engine. But most of the, he most of the heat is in the head, so with the liquid cooling we can dissipate that rapidly and efficiently. We also have a dry sump, which keeps the engine compact again, <coughs> and it allows us to run with a very small quantity of oil, relatively small, only about three quarts. Um, because the shape of the oil canister is, is slim and tall, uh, we know that at uh, a wide variety of, uh, of, of angles we can still get to that oil in the bottom of the canister. Now, one thing you should know if you're going to work on these engines is that it's important that you get the, the lines hooked up to the oil tank correctly. As you can see from this uh, picture of the top of the oil can, one line goes down to the bottom center of the oil tank, which is your feed line, which goes to the oil pump. Now, in that line, you will find the oil cooler in between the uh, oil tank and the oil pump and that is the oil is actually cooled on its way to the engine. Now you can see from this picture that if you were to actually hook up the uh, <coughs> if you were to hook up the oil feed line to the return line on the tank which comes in at an angle and, and actually sits above the oil level which is about here on the oil tank that would be a mistake and when you started up the engine you would not get any oil pressure uh, and if you continue to run it uh, for more than a few seconds you could damage the engine and we have had customers do that hook it up backwards so if you're ever in question as to which is the in and the out even though they are labeled on the tank the best thing for you to do is actually take the top of the tank off and look at it and then there's no confusion now <clears throat> one of the other tricks to making this engine uh, very compact is the pressed crank assembly five-piece crank uh, and, and because the crank parts are machined, forged separately, and pressed together, there again we can make it uh, very compact. Uh, you'll notice in this photo the engine does have plain uh, oil pressurized main bearings and lower rod bearings. Now we also utilize a gearbox, and the, uh, the gearbox is essential to the uh, formula that allows us to produce a lot of power out of a very compact engine. Now in the past, uh, gearboxes have gotten a bad rap in, in aviation engines, uh, but it's important to note that Rotax began life as a gearbox manufacturer, and it's their expertise uh, in manufacturing gearboxes that has allowed them to produce this lightweight geared engine. Uh, with the gearbox part of the package from the very beginning and not an add-on, the aft part of the gearbox is actually cast into the crankcase, and the engine was never envisioned uh, any other way. The gearbox uh, has received a number of improvements over the years, uh, but the current version is, is very reliable and very durable, requiring service only about every 600 hours, and that service typically uh, only costs about $100 uh, each time around. So, 
you know, you're talking about a, an hour uh, service requirement. So I would, uh, I would, I would encourage people to not be uh, concerned about that, uh, uh, the use of that gearbox. Um, because it works very, very well, and it is an essential part of making the engine do what it does. Now, because we're geared, uh, we can produce max power with a propeller speed of about 2,400 RPM. We uh, reduce the, uh, the uh, propeller by a ratio of 2.43 to 1 in the 912S engine. And so, there again, that makes the engine quieter. Uh, allows us to turn a very large diameter propeller, get a lot of static thrust for these low-speed airplanes, and uh, it's a big part of the equation. Now, the newer engines also include an overload clutch. Now, the overload clutch uh, is often referred to as a slipper clutch, but in fact, it does not slip unless you exceed or approach the maximum torque capability of the crankshaft. So, uh, it's really there just to guard the crankshaft in the case of a prop strike. It's really more uh, uh, important on a tractor than on a pusher. Uh, and if, if you have a tail dragger and you are you know, suscept susceptible to a potential prop strike, that overload clutch is pretty handy and it will help protect the crankshaft. Now it does have a 30-degree uh, set of uh, dogs in there, so actually it allows up to 30 degrees of movement between the propeller and the crankshaft when necessary. And there is friction in that zone. And what that does is it allows the gearbox to absorb the torsional vibration that every engine has without dam damaging the gears. That's one of the tricks that Rotax came up with to make this gearbox work. And the new gearboxes do go right to TBO. And typically, uh, they just need that basic service where we, uh, where we clean them and inspect them and uh, uh, replace some of the spring washers. But the, the gears and the shaft and all the major components, they go right to TPO now without any trouble. Uh, in the past, if you have, a, say, a four-cylinder Lycoming, like in a 0320 or an 0360, even an 0200, um, you're producing a lot of power at very low RPM and it's direct drive. So your power pulses are pretty, uh, uh, pretty severe. And that's why the propellers on the Lycomings and Continentals that are direct drive have to be so much stronger than the propellers that we get away with on these Rotaxes. And part of the key to our light package is not just the fact that the engine is very light, but the fact that we can use lightweight engines. When we're producing our power at 5,500 RPM with a four-cylinder engine, in effect, we're turning double the RPM of a Lycoming or Continental. So the power pulses are more like that of an eight-cylinder engine uh, than a four-cylinder engine because they're smaller pulses and there are a lot more of them. And that makes the engine very smooth. It also, because of the fact that they're smaller power pulses and we have this torsional vibration dampening device in the gearbox, the big power pulses don't get through to the propeller. And that allows us to use very lightweight uh, propellers uh, that you couldn't put on a direct drive engine or you would destroy the hub. We also use an aluminum cylinder. Again, uh, something that in the past a lot of people would, would hear and say, oh, aluminum cylinder, I don't want to touch that. Um, but they're nicosyl coated cylinders, and it's actually an, not an, so much a coating, it's impregnated into the cylinder wall. And it is absolutely incredible. I think it's one of the best parts of this engine. Uh, the aluminum nicosyl cylinders are very lightweight, of course, because they're aluminum and, and they don't have, they're not steel, and they don't have a steel liner. Uh, but also, nickel is uh, one of the best metals that we know of today for abrasion resistance. In fact, uh, when, when pump companies design large slurry pumps designed to, to pump abrasives like uh, stones or sand in water, they typically will build them out of nickel or line them with nickel because of its uh, resistance to abrasion. And that nickel silicon alloy that is on that cylinder wall makes these things wear like, well, I, I can't say wear like iron because it's really way better than iron. In fact, we've had engines come into our shop now with over 2,000 hours, like 22, I think the highest one was 2,200 hours, uh, running at 5,500 RPM cruise. Uh, and we measure the wear on the cylinders, uh, and I think that one was about a thousandth of an inch wear total. In fact, the tolerances are so tight that on a new 9 series engine, the tolerance out of the factory between the piston and the cylinder wall is zero 
to eight tenths of one thousandths of an inch total clearance. Um, there is no break in, there is no burning of oil. Everything is so precisely machined um, that uh, you can pretty much figure on about a quarter of a quart being consumed in 100 hours. And yes, uh, we can go 100 hours between oil change intervals if you're using unleaded fuel. Now, uh, uh, just to emphasize how tight that is, uh, I've taken brand new pistons and put them, pushed them in the cylinder without the rings and I can turn it upside down and it doesn't fall out. I mean, it just, it's, you, you really look at it and you go, this can't work, but it does. Now, the other thing is because they're Nicosil cylinders, uh, we don't have to worry about corrosion because they won't rust. And we don't have the shock cooling issues that you have with a steel cylinder and an aluminum piston because the aluminum piston and the aluminum cylinder will expand and contract together. Uh, and so that's why we can hold those very tight tolerances. Now, you might think that, uh, why is it that only Rotax has this technology? Um, and, and some people are skeptical when they hear about um, me talking about this Nicosil cylinder on these four-stroke engines. And uh, they, they think, well, you know, if it's so great, then why aren't other people using it? Well, they actually are. Um, uh, most of the new BMW automotive engines use Nicosil cylinders. Uh, Porsche has been using it on their engines for many years. And uh, so it's not really something that only Rotax uses. It is an expensive process, and therefore you, you typically only see it in the higher end automotive industry, but for an aircraft application, it is really good. Now, another feature of these engines is an electronic ignition system. Um, we have a completely redundant dual electronic ignition system, which essentially has no moving parts. Um, the flywheel is the only moving part, and of course you have to have a flywheel anyway. So the, the coils that you see in this slide are actually fixed to the block. And in the, uh, in the flywheel you have magnets that circulate around these coils and excite them. And that's where you get your, uh, your spark. Now, this ignition system differs from the electronic ignition system that you typically see in your car. In that it is a uh, AC ignition system. Automotive ignition systems run on DC off the battery. And that means that if your alternator should fail in your car, and I've had this happen to me, and you will continue to run off the battery until the battery dies. Now, if you're uh, in, the, in the winter time or in the summer where you're running your AC fan, it won't take you long to draw that battery down once you have uh, lost your alternator. And once your voltage drops down somewhere in the 11 volt range, your, your engine will stop running. That's really not acceptable on an aircraft. So what Rotax did was they made this AC ignition system. And you can see here that two of these coils, with the red arrow pointing at them, are the coils, one each, that power the ignition systems. Now, what that means, though, is that the actual energy for the spark is being generated as the engine is running. So when you're starting the engine, it is critical that you get about 240 RPM uh, to have enough uh, uh, rotational speed to create enough spark to get the engine to start. Um, so that is something you have to understand. It's the, it's the, it's the bad that comes with the good. Uh, we do need a strong battery and good connections to make sure the engine cranks over fast enough. And it also makes the engine um, not really uh, a candidate for prop starting uh, because we have to crank it over pretty fast. Um, the plus side of that is it's a simple system. There's really nothing, uh, there's not much to go wrong. And it's unlikely that anyone would ever start an engine by accident while turning the propeller over because you have to turn it over pretty fast. So that's a nice safety feature. Now those other coils that you see on that stator are to charge the battery. And so what we have, again, instead of having an external alternator uh, where you have belts uh, to worry about and mounting brackets to worry about breaking and vibration, our generating system is an AC system that, again, has no moving parts. It's bolted right to the, uh, uh, right to the block. And it has an external uh, solid state device which rectifies that AC current to 14 volt DC. And that gives you a maximum of 18 amps, which is enough for most of the modern uh, light sport airplanes, even with strobes and landing lights and a couple of radios and an EFIS, most of them can get by with that. Rotax does offer an external 40 amp alternator if you want to uh, carry a lit banner behind you. 
Uh, automotive spark plugs is another nice feature. Uh, if you guys have worked or had a Lycoming or Continental, you know how expensive uh, those spark plugs can be, those special aviation spark plugs. We actually started with aviation spark plugs, and they were like 20 bucks each. And Rotex quickly realized that they could use an automotive style spark plug and that they could still certify the engine with that. So that's what they did. And so the spark plugs are cheap and we change them every 100 hours on the 912S. There you see the, uh, the 70, uh, DCP R70 is for the 80 horsepower uh, 912. The 8E is used in the uh, 100 horsepower 912S and then the Denso uh, U9 is the, uh, is the correct spark plug for the 914 turbo. Now we utilize uh, constant depression carburetors in this engine. Uh, they work very well. Uh, they have uh, the ability to control the mixture. Uh, they actually do lean the engine as you climb. And uh, so there's no need for a mixture control. Uh, there isn't a mixture control. So all these engines are a single knob setup. You just have your throttle control and you're throttling the engine with the butterfly that you see in that left screen there. Uh, <coughs> there is a slide that you can see from the uh, intake side of the carburetor on the right picture. And that slide goes up and down pneumatically uh, via a chamber. There's an airtight chamber in the top of the carburetor uh, which it allows that uh, slide to go up and down uh, via vacuum. And what it does is it senses the pressure and it moves it up and down and brings that needle up and down inside that carburetor and that's what changes your mixture automatically as the density decreases. Pretty, pretty nifty. The carburetors do need service. I mean, they need to be maintained and taken care of. Um, and uh, if you do a reasonable job of, of taking care of them and setting up, they work very well. Two carburetors allow us to get a lot of power out of that little engine. Now, uh, if you have questions, uh, I'd, I'd ask you to hold them to the end, and I will leave some time at the end of this presentation to answer questions. There'll be somebody coming around with a microphone. So if you think of a question, try to remember it, and I'll be happy to answer it towards the end of the presentation. Uh, on this, uh, this uh, page from the Rotax website, you can see uh, the small size of this engine here, exactly 1,352 cc's of displacement for the 912S. Uh, quite remarkable, only 82.6 cubic inches in displacement. And that is, again, part of the reason that engine is so small and so light. And what is remarkable, uh, when you look at small automotive engines, and there really aren't that many in this country that are actually that small, 1.4 liters, um, those engines typically run at uh, 15, 20 percent power output. I mean, that's all they put out. If you open up your car, it's typically only for a short time to sprint up to 60 miles per hour. And then you've got to back off on the throttle. You're going to be exceeding the speed limit. Um, and these engines have to be built to run literally wide open. We have a lot of customers that prop them so that they will turn only 5,500 at full throttle. And, and they run them wide open except when they're on approach to landing and when they're on the ground. The rest of the time, they're right to the boards. And they take it. They'll go 1,500 hours like that, provided you keep the oil temperature, cylinder head temperature, coolant temperatures in the green, uh, and uh, maintain the engine properly. <coughs> now, uh, also, uh, the, the, the uh, engine comes in two versions. The 912S is the uh, FAR 33 certified engine. So the engine has uh, achieved full certification, and if you buy that version, uh, it can be placed in uh, standard category aircraft and used for any type of commercial application. What Rotax did was they, uh, they take the cost uh, that was involved in getting full certification and in keeping the paperwork trail that's required for those certified engines, and they only make the people that need uh, the additional uh, advantages that you can get from a fully certified engine to pay for those. So it's about $5,000 more if you want a fully certificated engine. Uh, if you're going to use uh, the ASTM compliant version, uh, which is what most of the uh, special light sport aircraft use, Rotax does ask that you fly only VFR day and night and uh, not fly IFR with that, with that particular type of engine. But you save quite a bit of money and uh, it is essentially the same engine. If you want to fly in a, there again, a standard category airplane uh, where you can use it for unlimited commercial ap applications 
or uh, if you want to fly IFR, then they ask that you put the FAR 33 version, which is the 912S. The 912ULS is the ASTM compliant version. Now, mechanics who wish to perform service uh, and maintenance on the Rotex aircraft engines, if they're installed on an SLSA, must meet the training requirements specified by Rotex and utilize the correct tools and fixtures as outlined in the applicable Rotex maintenance manuals. This is very important, not just to meet the letter of the regulation because most of the airframe manufacturers today, if not all, uh, require you to follow the Rotax maintenance uh, procedures and, and guidelines. So uh, to be legal on a special light sport aircraft and to be safe, uh, you need to have Rotax specific training. Now on the airframe side, uh, only mechanics that have an LSRM rating, which is a light sport repairman with a maintenance uh, rating or an AMP certificate. And you can also actually uh, uh, work on a special light sport if you uh, are a repair li FA licensed repair station. Can work on the, uh, um, the uh, special light sport aircraft, perform uh, uh, annual condition inspections. And you'll find in the manuals, uh, they will outline who can do what and what, what is required. I'm going to get into some details here on that. Now, when you're working on a special light sport aircraft, uh, the maintenance manual will tell you what the requirements are for uh, performing that maintenance. If that particular uh, maintenance item that you want to perform is not uh, covered in the maintenance manual, then you have to go to the uh, airframe manufacturer and get a procedure and approval to perform that maintenance. Um, this is an example uh, of a request for an avionics installation approval that flight design uses. Uh, you can't take a special light sport airplane to Gulf Coast Avionics and tell them you want a jam up panel. You just want them to put, put in uh, all this uh, great avionics, which you could do in a Cessna 172. You could go to Gulf Coast and tell them what you want and they can do it and they can do all the paperwork and out the door and you're, you're set. You can't do that with a special light sport. The actual airframe manufacturer has to approve uh, the installation of, of uh, all the avionics. So if you want something different than what's on your approved list, you have to get approval from the manufacturer and you need a procedure to make sure that it's being installed properly. Now, In this uh, section of the uh, CT manual, again, you can see uh, they're going over procedures for working on the landing gear section. And at the bottom of this uh, page here, they say minimum level of certification required, uh, repairman light sport aircraft maintenance, uh, or higher grade certificate. Task specific can be completed by a responsible individual who's received flight design uh, airplane operational training. Okay, so flight design actually has their own maintenance training that they make mechanics go through. Uh, there is a, a little catch though in this where it says a uh, light sport repairman certificate maintenance or higher, uh, the FAA doesn't like that wording. And they're actually saying that if it says that, there is no hire that you actually can only be a light sport repairman maintenance rated and perform the maintenance on this airplane that's laid out in this part of the manual. If you're an AMP, you can't do it. If you're an AMP with an IA, you can't do it. If you're an, uh, a repair station, you can't do it legally, even though we know they meant that when they said or hire. So uh, as a result, uh, these companies are now changing their manuals and including that specific wording. Uh, I think Flight Design, uh, they, they're putting out a bulletin that says uh, that that's what they meant to make sure everybody who has been working on them is legal and they're changing all their manuals. So just so you know, uh, that, that's a little catch that's coming and you need to check the manuals of the airplanes you're working on and make sure that they include, if you're an AMP, you as an AMP so that you're actually legal. Now it is important that you keep good records, accurate records on all the maintenance. Um, engine logs and air, air frame logs must be separate um, because uh, the uh, engine may be removed at some point and that log will go with the engine and you'll get a new log with the new engine. Now, types of training that are available from Rotax, uh, they have uh, three courses that are, that are very well, very good, very well laid out and they were actually uh, um, specified by Rotax what would be, oh, sorry, which would be what would be in each one of them doing the hand thing here, whacking the mic. Um, service is the first level. It's a two-day course. 
and it gives the student the necessary knowledge required to perform routine maintenance uh, up to a 100-hour inspection. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically 16 hours of training, uh, and it, uh, it's very good. Everyone I know that's gone through it has really enjoyed the course. For owners, it's a great, uh, great intro to Rotex. I mean, I'm going to give you some great information here in 45 minutes or so. Just imagine how much information we can give you in two full days. And they pack two full days. There's a lot of hands-on. Um, and we actually have our own school, our facility, with a, with a dedicated instructor who is back in the back of the room, Dean Vogel, uh, who, can, uh, who does a really good job of going through all that information. He'll be available after this presentation if you have any questions. The next level is maintenance level. And maintenance gives the student the necessary knowledge required to exchange components uh, and perform advanced troubleshooting. That's a two-day module. Of course, the service module is required before you go through the maintenance module. Um, between those two courses, four days of training, a mechanic can probably get 90% of the information he's ever going to need to work on Rotax engines. So that's a very time and cost-effective package with those two courses. Now, if you want to actually overhaul components, then you need to go through the next step which would be the heavy maintenance, um, because basically at, at the maintenance level, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be removing components. You can send them off to a repair station uh, like Lockwood, have them overhauled and then returned, and then you can uh, reinstall them on the, air for, on the engine and then uh, return it to service. And in fact, it, unless you're doing uh, those overhauls every day of those components, uh, cylinder heads, gearbox work, um, it's probably uh, better to just let a, a center that does it every day do it because you'll get rusty. I mean, you need to be doing it on a regular basis to stay current, and it requires quite a few special tools. Now, we do have uh, our next course scheduled June 15th and 16th. There is a service course uh, at our facility in Sebring, and on the 17th and 18th, we follow up with a maintenance course. So anybody who's interested in that can head over to our booth or talk to Dean and they can get you uh, signed up on those. We can only accept a maximum, is it 16, Dean? 16 for the service class, 12 for maintenance. Yeah, uh, 16 and 12 in those courses, and they do tend to fill up fairly quickly. Um, now, uh, Rotax has gone through and changed all their manuals uh, for the 9 series in the past couple of years. Uh, they spent a lot of time on it, and the results are quite good. Uh, the manuals are available online. I'm going to show you how you can get those manuals and download them as a PDF file at no cost. If you go to the Rotax website, on the bottom of this page here, you'll see www.rotax-aircraft-engines.com. That is one place where you can get all the technical information that's available for free. If you go to their website, you're going to see a page that looks just like this. If you look at those tabs across the top and you actually go over here and you click on documentation then it will pull up a page like this and you'll have pull down menu bars of course you're going to typically pick English 912 ULS and then in this case I have uh, clicked on maintenance manual and then this page will come up and you'll see the manuals that are available and uh, on the right these uh, PDF files if you click on those It'll open the file, and then you can actually print it uh, on, your, on your computer. There's another site that's very handy uh, for Rotax information. It's called the RON site, which stands for Rotax uh, Owners Association, and that is available at rotax-owner.com. Now, these uh, fellows up in uh, British Columbia have crafted a number of videos, uh, training videos, which help you go through different procedures required to maintain these engines. They're very good. In this case, if you were to, uh, if you were to click on yeah, support and roll down to expanded video instructions, um, you're going to find some great videos. And there again, you can download those for free. Now, uh, before we move on, I want to go over just a few uh, carburetor tips. The carburetors on the Rotax aircraft engines, uh, the, uh, the 9 series, they should be synchronized using uh, separate vacuum gauges uh, and rechecked every 100 hours. Uh, this should be done by someone who, who knows how to do it. It is important uh, to make sure the engine idles smoothly. And the reason is you've essentially got 
uh, two separate engines, really, that are sharing the same crankshaft. You've got two cylinders on one side fed by one carburetor, two cylinders on the other side fed by the ever, other carburetor, very lightweight crank uh, flywheel. And it's important that those two carburetors are, um, are set at the same vacuum. Um, they're throttled with a butterfly. And if one is more advanced than the other, then you're going to have a strong power pulse and a weak power pulse, a strong power pulse and a weak power pulse. And what that causes is it's known as torsional vibration. Uh, if the engine is set up properly, the carburetors are balanced, it will idle like a sewing machine. It'll run like a sewing machine, and that's the way it should be. It'll also affect starting. Um, you won't notice it very much at high power settings because things will even out when, at, at high power settings. It's at the lower power settings that the carbs sink and setting up the idle are, are so, so critical. Minimum idle speed is 1400 RPM. The engine has a very high performance camshaft, and it is uh, a high compression engine. So it doesn't want to idle uh, below 1,400 RPM. Now realize uh, that at 1,600 RPM, which is a typical idle for this engine, uh, you've got only 658 propeller RPM because of the geared reduction drive. So a propeller is still turning quite slowly. Uh, you'll tick, pick up about 200 RPM from the time you start the engine till the time it warms up. Uh, so if you set your idle at 1,600 RPM, then it'll be unlikely it'll go below 1400 when it's cold. So that's a good range. We don't, we, some heavy propeller uh, designs require an idle of up to 1800 RPM to keep everything smooth, but we don't like to go over 1800 uh, because at that point the uh, choke system, the originating system won't work because the butterfly won't actually close enough to allow the, the originating circuit to work. Now that's another tip that I can give you when you're starting these engines in cold weather. If you're going to use what we call the choke, it's actually an enrichening circuit. That circuit, what it does is it opens up a valve which allows extra fuel to flow from the float chamber up into the venturi. But in order to make that work, the butterfly that throttles the engine has to be closed almost all the way. So what does that mean? That means if you're using what we call the choke circuit, you better have the thro throttle all the way back at idle. If you crack the throttle, you will decrease the effectiveness of the choke dramatically. So in cold weather, Pull the throttle all the way back, pull your enrichening circuit on or your choke on all the way, start the engine. As soon as it lights, you can advance the throttle then and still get some effectiveness out of the choke. It really has almost no effectiveness, though, at, at high power settings. Now, on some of the uh, airplanes coming over from Europe, and as we know, a lot of the special light sports today are coming in from Europe, they use different antifreeze over there. So it's important to, to understand the fact that if you see something like this uh, in the manual or on the firewall where it says 80% antifreeze, 20% water. Uh, you can't do that with the American antifreeze. Now, U.S. antifreeze will work in these airplanes, but it's, a, it's, a, it's mixed at a, a different uh, density. So with our antifreeze, we typically use a product called Dexcool, which is made by a number of different companies. 50-50 um, with distilled water is the way we mix it. And certainly you can't mix it any richer than 66% uh, coolant, okay? Uh, if you do, some of the particles in that uh, coolant are going to drop out and they're going to form crystals inside the engine and actually uh, impede the cooling. So 50-50 <clears throat> is what we like to see. If you see that uh, on a European-style airplane, uh, you, know, you, you don't want to do that with our coolant. Usually after about 200 hours or two years, we'll drop the European coolant out and replace it with Dexcool, and then from that point on, you can, you can buy it locally. We do stock some of the European coolant uh, for uh, people who need to top off their engines while they're new until they switch. Now, uh, <clears throat> uh, we get a lot of questions about oil uh, because you, you don't want to use typical aircraft oil in these engines. As uh, I discussed earlier in the presentation, they're really built more like automotive engines, automotive or motorcycle type engines with their, with their tight tolerances uh, and the metallurgy that's used inside the engine. So what we like to use is an automotive style engine with a gearbox additive, and that would be a motorcycle oil. That's the way most motorcycle oils are used today because we use our engine oil to lubricate our gearbox just like most modern motorcycles do today. Uh, in this case, you can see this uh, mechanic is uh, filling up the oil tank with uh, the new AeroShell product. Now, 
Uh, we have three types of oil that we typically use or get questions about. One would be a full synthetic, and this is one of the best examples of that, Mobile One. Um, that is an ideal oil if you're going to go with just unleaded fuel. Now the base stock in Mobile One and, and most of these full synthetic oils, they do not react well with tetraethyl lead. If you use uh, 100 LL, uh, it will tend to cause a lead paste within the engine, which is like a waxy substance, and it literally will plug up the oil passageways and eventually it could cause the engine to fail due to oil starvation. So um, we like to use the Mobile One in applications where the customer is only using uh, auto gas, unleaded auto gas. I mean, you could get a little bit of av gas in there, but you don't want to be using too much. Then we have mineral-based oils, which are less expensive. This is an example of a, a Penn's oil, motorcycle oil, which is available in uh, 2050 and, and uh, 1040 weights. And uh, uh, those oils tend to be uh, maxed out at 50-hour oil change intervals. You can't go to the 100-hour oil change intervals. And they typically will work with uh, different types of, of uh, fuel. And then you have the new shell product, which uh, appears to be a very good product. It actually has the Rotax name on the bottle. Uh, it was developed in cooperation with Rotax. Um, it's a uh, 10W40 weight, so it'll work in any temperature range, uh, cold or hot. And it, was, uh, it is a semi-synthetic, so it has many of the properties of a synthetic oil, but using Shell's experience uh, with Avgas, many years of experience with Avgas, they were able to blend a semi-synthetic, which will work with Avgas. Now, I'm talking about the different fuels here. I just want to mention oil change intervals and how they can be affected by the, the type of fuel that you are using. If you want to go with 100-hour oil change intervals, uh, it appears that you can do that with this Shell product, as well as with the full synthetic uh, products like Mobile One. But um, if you want to use Avgas, and you're using it, uh, say, up to 30% of the time, um, that's going to whack you back to no more than 50 hours between oil change intervals, regardless of the type of oil you're using. If you're using Avgas uh, more than that, primarily uh, Avgas, then we recommend oil changes every 25 hours. You've got to realize we only have a little over three quarts of oil. So with that small amount of oil, we'll get uh, loaded up with lead fairly quickly if you're using Avgas. Now, you can use Avgas, but there again, you should move to the uh, more frequent oil change intervals. Uh, we get a lot of questions about the oil filters on these engines because it is an automotive type filter. However, it is, uh, it is a, a filter that is specially made uh, for the Rotax application. And one of the differences between this and, a, and an automotive filter that you might find at, at uh, your, your local auto parts store, uh, and, and we have had guys go to the auto parts stores and find filters that they can get to fit on this engine. But the bypass, uh, ratio, the bypass valve is set at a higher pressure on these filters. The reason for that is in a, in a car, you can stand to have a lower uh, bypass pressure because it's unlikely that you would start your car up and uh, warm it up for a very short period of time and then go to full power and leave it there. Um, not many people do that in their car, you know, start it up and, you know, get it out of the driveway, warm it up a little bit, and then just firewall it and head to work. Uh, what, what that would do is it would cause your filter to go in bypass. Now, with the Rotax filter, the bypass uh, pressure is high enough and the, the uh, filtering material is such that as long as your oil temperature is above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you should not be bypassing the filter element, even at full power. And that's the reason that well, one of the reasons Rotax uh, requires a 120 degree Fahrenheit temperature uh, before you go to uh, full power on the oil. Now, uh, you'll notice that uh, there's a bit of torque seal on this filter. It's a good idea once you've finished uh, tightening the filter to put the torque seal on there. Uh, Rotax lists a procedure uh, to tighten that filter, and what they say is that the filter should be, uh, uh, you put clean the, uh, the, the contact surface on the engine, and then put a coat of fresh oil on the uh, gasket on the filter, screw it on, and then when you get solid contact, which is about an eighth of, an eighth of a turn beyond touching, solid contact, you go 270 degrees. And that's, uh, that's uh, where they want to see that filter. 
What we usually do is after we've uh, done an initial run, uh, run the engine for a few minutes to check for leaks after an oil change, uh, it's always a good idea before you cow your engine up that you do that. Um, you know, run it, make sure nothing's leaking, then go back to the filter and, and try and screw it off. And if it, do, you know, if it wants to come off, then it needs to be a little tighter. Um, <clears throat> people who live up north often in, let their uh, airframe sit for the winter. Uh, one, of the, one of the biggest concerns there is uh, the fuel going bad. If you use auto gas, auto gas is you know, only going to last a month or so uh, in the carburetor bowls before it starts to uh, um, uh, go sour on you. So we recommend that you either fill up with Avgas um, before you make your last flight of the season, which is very stable and tends to, uh, to sit in storage uh, well for an extended period of time. Or if you're using auto gas, put a fuel stabilizer in it, uh, like this uh, Pennzoil product. There's also a, a product available at uh, Walmart called Stable, which works. And those things, those products really do a great job. Uh, they will keep the oil or the fuel fresh throughout the winter and you won't have gummed up carburetors come spring. Now, uh, Rotex does have different octane ratings for the different engines. One of the advantages of the 80 horsepower version of the engine is that it will run on 87 octane fuel. So if you're flying overseas, if you're flying and you want to use MoGas at, at an airport, uh, if you have an 80 horsepower engine, you can fill up. And remember, when you go to uh, airports that have MoGas, it's often only 87 octane. Now, if you have a 912S, that requires 91 octane or higher, so premium grade. The same with a 914 turbo. So even when you see an airport listed that has MoGas, you usually still have to use the Avgas because the MoGas is usually only 87 octane. Now, that's changing. A lot of airports that have MoGas now are going to the higher octane because they're realizing that even though the STCs for a lot of these airplanes only need 87 octane, the Rotaxes need 91 or better. So what we're seeing is at our airport they're going to put in auto gas, uh, I know within the next six months, and they're going to they're run premium out there. Now uh, if you have a two-stroke, the, uh, the 447, the 503, the 582 will all run on 87 octane fuel. The 618 is the only one that needs premium. Now we do have a tester available now that will allow you to test for ethanol content. And uh, ethanol is certainly one of the points where we do get a lot of questions. Uh, with this tester, you can uh, fill it up to the uh, zero mark that you see right there, and then uh, add fuel up to, to this mark right here. Shake it up and let it sit for a little bit. And uh, if the fuel has alcohol in it, what will happen is the alcohol will fall out and attach itself to the water because there's so much water relative to the amount of gasoline in this tube. And this level will rise. And if it rises to here, that's 5% ethanol. If it rises to here, that's 10%, 15, 20. So it's pretty handy and it's pretty easy to tell how much and if you have ethanol uh, in that gasoline. Now, Rotax over the years has officially proved, approved gasoline with up to 5% uh, ethanol. Um, they have recently moved to approve fuel up to 10% ethanol um, as long as your fuel tanks can handle it. The engine itself can handle it. Um, they also, I'm gonna, at the end of the presentation, I'll just uh, tell you about a few changes to the fuel system that should be made if you are going to run 10% ethanol. Um, ethanol does affect fuel lines, uh, although the engine uh, major components in the carburetor are Viton, um, the engine doesn't seem to mind the 10% at all. Fuel lines and uh, fuel fittings, uh, fuel tanks can be affected by it. This is a, a, an example of a common fuel line used in ultralight and light sport airplanes. You can see what it looked like new. You can see what it looked like after a couple of years of use. So you have to be careful make sure those lines are, are high grade or that they're changed often. Uh, there's a new product available, uh, aftermarket, but uh, it appears to have the consent uh, of Rotax. It's called a soft start module, and it's a uh, it's pretty, pretty nifty little piece of electronic equipment. Uh, we have one in our booth over in Building D if you want to take a look at it. Uh, what it does is it, it retards the ignition timing on the engine 
from uh, 26 degrees before top dead center back to 4 degrees uh, when you uh, hit the starter. And uh, it, it keeps it there until two seconds after you release the starter. And what that does is it avoids uh, kickback that can occur uh, when you're using just the standard modules. The standard modules actually retard the, the, the uh, they start out with the, with the uh, ignition timing retarded, but then uh, as soon as they see about 800 RPM, they advance it. And every now and then when you're starting, the engine will jump to 800 RPM and then come back and keep cranking. At that point, the ignition timing has been advanced and you can get a backfire or a kickback, which is hard on the gearbox. This was only in installed on one of the ignition modules, and then you start on that, what we call magneto, and then as soon as you start it, you go back to both. Now here's uh, that drawing of the uh, uh, fuel system that I was going to talk about here. And uh, you can see that uh, we come from the fuel tank, this is the fuel tank, through a filter, and uh, uh, by an electric fuel pump, which should have a bypass around it in case it gets plugged up, and uh, into the mechanical pump, which is actually mounted on the gearbox itself. And then uh, we go to this uh, uh, distribution block, which is be mounted between the carburetors on the engine. Well, this is the part that I wanted to uh, mention. At this point here, there should be a return line. And that is essential if you're going to use uh, fuel with alcohol in it. What that does is it assures that there's always a stream of fuel circulating in your engine compartment, uh, and that if any air or air uh, vapor pockets should develop, um, that will allow them to be returned to the fuel tank so you won't get any vapor lock. You won't suffer from vapor lock. But on some of the airplanes, uh, Technum is one example, that return fuel line goes back to the tank and it only goes back to one tank or the other. If you have wing tanks right and left, you need to know which tank it's returning to and you want to make sure that if you start out your flight with full fuel, that you start it with that tank. Now, uh, at this point, I'd like to take any questions that we might have. Um, got a mic right here. Okay, take that. Uh, Paul back Bell, there I wanted to say that the Roan uh, dialogue that they had there, I thought that was excellent with the videos, and I wanted to know uh, how many uh, watts it the engine puts out at what power level. The, the, uh, the output of the, the generator for right. charging? Um, well, I, I, I can't tell you what the uh, output is at, at any given power level. I think they have a chart in the uh, installation manual which will give you that information. I can tell you um, what you really need to know is that you can only count on about 14 amps of power uh, for your max continuous load. It will put out 18 amps at full power, but what we found is in reality, in, in practice, if your, your, if you add up all the loads that you have and it's 14 amps or less, everything works just fine. If you try and draw more from that uh, system on a continual basis, you'll overheat the, the coils. Uh, next question over here. Uh, yes, on uh, low oil pressure, uh, there's been several discussions on the internet about putting uh, just changing the spring and the ball. Uh, your thoughts on that? Well, if you I'm running about 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, 30 pounds would be uh, would be safe. Yeah. But it's less than normal. Okay. Uh, so if I if I have an engine that is running uh, less than what I consider to be normal, say 40, 45 to 55 would be typical uh, for a warm engine. Um, first thing I would do is I would check for an instrument error because it's very unusual to see one of these engines actually run low oil pressure. Um, normally it's the sender, uh, the, the oil pressure sender, uh, <coughs> which in this picture right here uh, would be located right here next to the uh, oil pump. Okay. Uh, I would, I would, what we do in our shop is we have a uh, calibrated mechanical gauge uh, that we have to send out for calibration once a year. We hook that up to the oil system and we see exactly what the oil pressure really is. If, it's, if it is equal to what your gauge is saying, then we would pull the spring and either add a shim or put a different spring in there. Often just replacing the spring is enough to increase the oil pressure. Uh, but in most cases, that is not the problem. The problem is an indication error and it's usually the sender. So we'll replace the sender 
and the pressure comes up to where it should be. And, and the senders tend to fail in that manner. The pressure indication drops. Okay, so that's usually what happens. But yes, uh, you can increase the pressure by changing the spring or adding a shim. But don't do it until you make sure that your indication is correct. Uh, another question right back here. Um, the explanation for not using a mixture control was very good, and I understand that. What's the reason for not using um, carburetor heat on this particular engine and carburation system? Okay, um, it's really up to the airframe manufacturer or in the, plate, in the case of experimental aircraft, the owner, uh, builder of the airplane to decide whether they want carburetor heat or not. Uh, Rotax doesn't say that you don't need carburetor heat. In fact, uh, these engines tend in most installations to be less prone to icing than some uh, Lycomies and Continentals, but it differs with the installation. Uh, and they can ice under uh, certain conditions. Uh, I think that the installations that seem to be most prone to icing are open, uncowled pusher installations. Uh, and, and typically where we see ice would be in a temperature range uh, 40 to 50 degrees, very humid, almost misting conditions. You can ice the engine, particularly at low power settings. Now the in installations that tend to be less prone to icing would be cowled installations where the engine breathes warm air from within the cowl, okay? And the carburetors tend to be warmer. They're sitting right on top of the, ex uh, the exhaust pipes. And, and so you don't get, you know, some of those installations, you never hear of icing, okay? But there are several means of, uh, of installing carb, carb heat. One is off the muffler, uh, and the other is a water jacket which, uh, which attaches to the carburetor and actually heats the carburetor body. Okay, and, and those are available. The one that amounts to the uh, uh, carburetor body is relatively easy to install, and it can be left on all the time and offers almost no power loss. Uh, so pretty slick setup. If you, you basically have to do the research and find out if your installation is one of those that's prone to it and if you're going to be flying in conditions that could cause it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, right here, and then we'll move over to you, sir. I'm building an uh, amateur experimental aircraft. Um, I'm going to be putting a 912 UL, uh, ULS uh, engine in it. And what I'd like to know is if I do the service and or maintenance training that you offer, uh, will that qualify me to do the balancing of the carburetors, which you indicated was, uh, was critical to the proper function? Uh, balancing would come in the maintenance service okay cool good thing we got Dean here yeah so y y you would get that in that first two days and they actually will will run an engine and you'll see it done and you'll get to participate in it so it's it's really it's it's good training in that respect once you see it done you see how what's involved um, most people can do it themselves over here okay over here uh, thank you uh, two quick questions what about in KG, I think it's called for f coolant, and I'm running a mobile motorcycle oil now. If I want to switch to aero shell, do I need to completely drain the engine or just change the three quarts you know, like you would normally do? Okay, uh, first on the uh, Evans coolant, uh, you, some people do use Evans coolant. Uh, Rotax at this point leaves it up to the airframe manufacturer to recommend to you which one you should use, and it's really based on the, the temperatures that your engine operates at. Uh, actually, the standard coolant, let's say Dexcool mixed 50-50 with distilled water, does a better job of cooling the engine than the Evans. Typically when you switch over to Evans, the engine will run about 20 degrees hotter. Um, the reason that, that some people want to run Evans or some installations need to run Evans is because it doesn't boil until it hits about 340 degrees, whereas conventional coolant with the pressure cap that we use will boil at about 250 degrees, 248 degrees. Our cylinder head temp max on the 912S is 275. That's based on detonation. If you go over 275 degrees cylinder head temp, you can detonate, burn a hole in the piston, okay? The cylinder heads themselves are good for about 300 degrees. Before, if you exceed 300, you're going to damage the cylinder head. On the low compression 80 horsepower engine, 
you can run up to 300 degrees. Okay, so if you're running like 260 degrees cylinder head temp with, a, with an 80 horsepower engine, uh, you're gonna, you could boil the coolant and you're going to get air pockets and you can blow the coolant out of the engine. If you switch to Evans, you'll bump up to 280, but in that case, you're still, with, you're still under the 300 max, so you're still safe and you're not going to boil the coolant. So that's where the Evans comes in for installations that are running eh, right up there near that 248 degree maximum coolant temperature. It gives them a bunch of headroom. And, and on those hot running installations, when you land on a hot day and the engine's heat soaked and you, you know, you're taxiing downwind and you're not getting much air through the engine, a lot of them will want to boil the coolant then and that Evans will stop that. So, and you got to realize it's not the engine that makes it run hot. I mean, I have installations that run 120 degrees. They barely come off the peg at any time. Um, the air cam's like that. It's, it's always running too cold. And then we see other installations that run 200 degrees on, on a hot day, 210, they're, they're perfect. Uh, and then you see other installations that run up near the limit, 250, 260, even 270, and, and that's where that Evans comes in. Does that answer your question? Okay, now on the oil, uh, if you're going to switch from a conventional uh, motorcycle oil to the aeroshell, uh, you do not have to do anything special. You drain the canister, do a nor normal oil change, <coughs> and in fact, Rotax does not want you to drain the oil cooler or the lines. Okay? They want you to leave that oil in there because they don't want to get air ingested into the lifters. Uh, any more questions? Right here? Hang on just a second, sir. Let me get, get the mic. There you go. Uh, is TCP any help to you when you have to use av gas? Yes, uh, we have found that TCP is helpful. It does help uh, mitigate the negative effects of uh, tetraethyl lead in av gas, uh, especially if you're going to run lower power settings. It, it helps take the lead and it just shh, burns it right out of the engine uh, without building up lead on the valves. So it, is, uh, it, is, it does, does work. Right here. Yeah, I've heard about the uh, procedure for, uh, some people refer to it, burping the engine after an oil change. I, I don't know if that's after a normal oil change or if after a complete drain. Can you define when you need to do that and what that procedure involves? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the burping the, the engine comes from the fact that we're a dry sump engine <coughs> and our oil that accumulates in the bottom of the crankcase as the engine's lubricated and cooled by the oil it all flows down into the bottom of the crankcase and there's a fitting there with a line that goes back to the oil tank. So blow by from the engine pressurizes the crankcase and pushes that oil uh, back to the oil canister. Okay, so this new, these new oils today do a really good job of coating and sticking to the engine. So when you shut off your engine, there's going to be a lot of oil left inside the engine and that oil is going to eventually accumulate down in the bottom of the case. Okay. If the oil canister is mounted high, um, that, that problem can be compounded by the fact that the oil can siphon back through the oil pump if your oil tank is mounted high uh, and, and accumulate in the bottom of the case. Uh, the burping, the primary thing with the burping for most end users is when you check your oil, you pull that dipstick out. If it's in the flat range, you just go fly. You don't have to burp the engine. You know you have enough oil, you're fine. If you pull the dipstick and it's below the acceptable range, that flat section on the dipstick, then you may need to add oil. Okay? We know that's unlikely with this engine because they don't use much, but still, we can't just assume that it has enough oil in it. So that's when we burp it. At that point, we'd leave the top off the canister, pull the prop through in the direction of normal rotation, and the easiest way to do that is pull it up till you get a power stroke, top dead center, hold it there, and then go to the next because we're looking for maximum blow-by, right? So we don't just want to pull the engine through. We just want to pull it and hold it right at top dead center just before it pops over. We're